I woke up this morning, uh, I was staying at a hotel uh, by the water, and I picked up um, the newspaper, which was outside my door. And in the news today was, uh, again, New Orleans, that was, um, that was the headline. Uh, LA, Louisiana flood projects behind schedule. They're about uh, eight months, they say, to a year behind schedule and building up uh, flood protection for New Orleans. The Iraq war was obviously in the newspaper. Uh, California is suing the EPA to be able to regulate uh, tailpipe emissions. Um, oil was over $90 a barrel. The American Academy of Pediatrics called for the U.S. government to take aggressive action um, on climate change because global warming, in quotes, will harm the health of our children disproportionately. Energy costs were the top concern now of the American public. That was all in the paper today. So I'll try to put all that in perspective and in context. I'll talk about why I'm here, and I'll talk about how all that relates to you. Three other events that recently happened, one you're all too familiar with, um, which have to do with the fires outside the city. Another event that recently took place was flooding in New Orleans. They had some huge rains, and the town city flooded again just recently. And there's a drought going on in the southeast, um, something that uh, hasn't happened, uh, I think, uh, since we had um, recorded history in that area. Uh, what does that all have to do with climate change? And what does all of that have to do with why I'm here? Well, if we look at the extremes in our society, they will, if we look at one extreme, they will tie those three events directly to global warming. They will tell you that the fires were a direct result of global warming or the flooding or the drought in the southeast. If we look at the other extreme, they will say it's all natural, caused the natural phenomena, and we've experienced it before and we're going to experience it again. If you ask scientists about those three events and climate change, they will say that yes, it's tied to global warming, and that yes, it's part of a natural event. They will basically agree with both ends of the spectrum. What scientists have been saying is that at about seven tenths or eight tenths of a degree centigrade global warming above pre-industrial levels, which is where we are today, that we will begin to see the effects of global warming. And so the events that we're seeing today are possibly tied to global warming, but they're kind of a window into the future. And that's what we should take away from these events. The title of the talk today is Nation Under Siege. I will be talking in global terms, but I'll bring it home to the US, that the US is very, very vulnerable in many, many respects, and we'll go through that today. First, let's talk about climate change. What we want to know is, when is this supposed to happen? Now, just aside, all the information that I will talk about today comes from mainstream science. That means I will not give you any information from this side of the spectrum, this extreme, or that extreme, because what they do is interpret the science for their own political agenda, social agenda, economic agenda, personal agenda, whatever other agenda they have, they will cherry pick the information and tell you what supports their point of view. So all the information that you will see on the screen comes from the scientific community that we entrust to give us the information and interpret it if they do interpret it. From NOAA, 
from NASA, from Woods Hole, from Scripps, from the National Center for Atmospheric Research, from the Department of Energy, from the Energy Information Administration, and from our national laboratories, and from the IPCC. That's it. So, according to those folks, when is climate change going to happen? Obviously, some of it is happening now. We're at seven to eight tenths of a degree centigrade global warming. What are they projecting will happen? And these are just what they are. They're projections. They're if, if we go there. This is what we can expect, possibly. And then third is if the projections are bad, and we don't like them, how can we avoid them? We'll try to answer those three questions, and that's what the study nation under siege attempted to do. This is from NOAA. This is going back 450,000 years. This is global average temperature in blue. And you can see for the most part, most of you know this, I'll run through this fairly quickly, but you can see that for the most part, the Earth has been in a cooling state. We've been under that horizontal line. And about every 120,000 years, 130,000 years or so, you see a spike. The Earth comes out of this cooling situation, basically an ice age, into a, an interglacial period, a warm period. The last warm period was about 125,000 years ago, the spike over to the left from the, from, the, from the right. You can see all the blue lines all the way over to the right. That represents the last 12,000 years. The Earth, over the last 12,000 years, rather than going back and forth and up and down, settled into a very nice and comfortable climate, climatic pattern. We've had very stable temperatures over this period of time. For whatever reason, it moved into that pattern. And we've been able to flourish and multiply. As a human species, we've been able to create farming communities, towns, cities, and now megacities and global economies in this very comfortable period. Now you look at the red line. The red line is carbon dioxide parts per million in the atmosphere, and you can see it sits pretty much on top of the blue line. It's a greenhouse gas. We've never been over 300 parts per million. You see the scale on the left-hand side for the past 450,000 years and probably for a few million years. We're now at 385 parts per million. We're actually off the chart. We're going to 450 parts per million by the year 2035. Business as usual, probably 700 parts per million by the end of the century. This is a huge experiment that we're conducting on the planet. When we burn fossil fuels, we give off about 20 billion tons of CO2 a year. Now it's a little more. Two billion tons are soaked up by the terrestrial earth. That's the plants, the soils, the grasses, everything that's green. Eight billion tons get soaked up in the oceans, roughly, and about 10 billion tons goes into the atmosphere, raising atmospheric parts per million. It used to be 1.7, it's now two, 2.2 parts per million a year. So when you hear folks say, well, we can plant our way out of this, that's just not going to happen, not possible. We know it's us. This is from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. The black line is actual temperature. The blue line is what happens when they run the models, and they run these back in time to make sure they have a good fit, is when you have all natural phenomena, solar variation, volcanic activity, you get the blue line all natural phenomena. When you add in greenhouse gases, you get the red line that sits on top of the black line. That's how we know it's us. We know where the heating is happening. It's not happening over the oceans. It's happening in the northern latitudes, part in the southern latitudes, mostly over land. And if you look at the United States over to the left, it's happening in the west more than it's happening in the east right now. And that does not bode well for us as soils dry out and trees get stressed. So when are we, what are scientists telling us about climate change and a timeline? What kind of time frame are we talking about here? Well, 
The European Union established 450 parts per million as dangerous climate change a number of years ago, though, along with American scientists at a meeting at Exeter in England. NASA just came out 450 parts per million. A paper was just published by 47 scientists from NASA on the East Coast to Lawrence Berkeley on the West Coast. Many of our top scientists. One paper, 450 parts per million, is a threshold. It could be even less. If we go beyond that, we experience what they term dangerous climate change, and in quotes, they use the term out of humanity's control. That means we have no control over what happens anymore, and they're basically talking about the polar ice caps melting and sea level rising. And it could be dramatic, could take time. So, when do we reach 450 parts per million? Well, we're at 385 today. If you project up, we should reach 450 parts per million by the year 2035. In that same paper from 47 scientists, they say that if we build the infrastructure, the fossil fuel burning infrastructure, if we build business as usual, the infrastructure over the next 10 years will not be able to avert getting to 450 parts per million. This shows you in around 2020, 2030 to the left, and then the end of the century to the right, where the warming is going to happen and what the temperatures are going to be. And it looks like over the United States, we're going to get close to the two degrees centigrade by about 2029, probably less, maybe 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, and then push well over 2 degrees centigrade, probably by about 2050, and then into the 3 and 4 and 5 degrees centigrade on out. So you need to ask yourself the question, what happens if we go to 450? What does a 2 to 3 degrees centigrade world look like? What's the world that some of us who are young enough will be living in, or those of you who are my age, what kind of world are we leaving our children and grandchildren to grow up in? So what are the projections? What are mainstream science telling us what the projections are? Well, let's take a stroll through the two to three degree centigrade world. They're telling us no more polar bears, probably no more walruses, probably no more species of Arctic seals. Isotherms, which are bands of temperature that go around the Earth, similar bands of temperature, which have ecosystems tied to them, are moving toward the poles, both the North and South Pole, at about 30 miles a decade. And they're moving up mountains. And all the plants and animals that depend on that climate for their existence travel with the bands the isotherms. And, in fact, it's now been documented that we see a migration of plants and animals toward the poles and up the mountains. Well, what happens when you get to the top of the mountain or to the pole? There are plants and animals there, and you got plants and animals coming up behind them. Those that are there then become extinct, and that's how it works. Or if you're on an island and you can't migrate, you're done maybe at an earlier time. Snowpack in the Rocky Mountains, 30% less snowpack, possibly even 70%. You see some reports, but we know there's going to be less with warmer temperatures. This is Lake Mead today, supplies Arizona. Las Vegas with its water. That was the water mark at the white, top of the white level. That's 100 feet down. That's where it is today. We, all, we know all two it's all too, too uh, close to us here that forest fire soils will dry out as we get into that two to three degree temperature range and studies for the West are projecting between double and quadruple the acreage burned because of stressing out plants and drier soils and these periods of both extreme weather, drought, and then heavy rains as warmer air can hold more moisture comes down faster in a very short period of time and the soils don't get a chance to 
absorb it. Scientists are tying water content and energy content intensity of hurricanes to warmer ocean temperatures and climate change. Coral reefs between 2 and 3 degrees centigrade are expected to be bleached. 25% of all marine species live in and around and feed off of coral reefs. In fact, the largest study ever conducted by the U.S. scientists with counterparts around the world came out a while back that 25% of all, all species on Earth, plant and animal species on Earth, would be gone by 2025. And NASA, if you get on their website, expects business as usual 50% by 2100. The UN has put out a number of reports that the poorest nations will get hit the hardest. Bangladesh, for example, Africa, and that we owe them we need to dig into our pockets and help them through the hard times because we are a wealthy nation and can potentially adapt. We know that now that Greenland is contracting and the same thing, we have ice melt now in West Antarctic and that doesn't bode well. The IPCC and the computer modelers cannot project ice melt. Very difficult. In fact, the ice is melting in the Arctic. It's about 30 years ahead of the projections. It's because ice melt is a chaotic process, and the water goes where it wants. It lubricates the bottom of ice sheets. You get movement. You get ice moving into the oceans. There's all sorts of issues with simulating ice melt. So in their wisdom, the IPCC took ice melt on the poles out of the equation of sea level rise. And they projected with thermal expansion and glacial melt, land-based glacial melt, about a 7-inch to 23-inch sea level rise by 2100. I think the US delegation was very upset about this because new data had come in since the cutoff time for papers to influence the IPCC report. And so they put in a number of caveats, and this was one of them. The last time the polar regions were significantly warmer, basically at 2 to 3 degrees centigrade global warming, for an extended period of time during that last interglacial period, 125,000 years ago that you saw, sea level was 4 to 6 meters higher. And if you go to the University of Arizona site, to uh, Jonathan Overpeck site, who's a paleoclimatologist, they've determined that that happened, the four meters to six meters happened over a period of about 125 years. So it happened rather rapidly. You now hear scientists talking about rapid sea level rise if the poles begin to go. And if we reach the 450, all bets are off. They begin talking about sea level rise a number of meters by 2100, possibly a meter in decades. Who knows? We now know that NASA, in a very recent publication, has data that Greenland, at the higher altitudes, is beginning to melt. The problem we face here is that 53%, including you all, of all Americans live in and around coastal cities and towns in coastal counties. And most of the studies that have been done to date on sea level rise talk about that six meters. And you heard people talk about six meters and then you've heard the opposition saying, well, that's way, way in the future. And you've seen the mapping on six meters. This is, for example, from NASA from their website. And you can see that most of Florida goes. But people think about that way off in the future, six meters. So we did a study using data sets from the US Geologic Survey. We hired a group out of Santa Fe, a group of scientists. 
We did a study, half of that, three meters. We wanted to see what would happen. We did three meters up to five, six meters. Let me take you down the East Coast and up the West Coast. This is Boston. That would be just a three meter sea level rise, half of the six meters. That would be the, the fi a five meter sea level rise. Go down to New York and New Jersey, that's just three meters, that's five meters. Down to Savannah, that's three meters, that's five meters. The only part of the city is the old part. The first part that was built was smartly built on a bluff, that survives. Over to San Diego, that's three meters, that's five meters. Coronado, three meters and five meters. Up the coast, Marina del Rey, Santa Monica, the LA area, three meters and five meters. And then over to Alameda, the Bay Area, three meters, five meters, and then all the way up to Seattle, three meters and five meters. Pretty devastating. What astounded us in this study was we went down to one meter. We wanted to see what would happen to the U.S. with a one meter sea level rise. One meter plus, one meter maybe up to two. No one's done this study because it takes LIDAR data to get real accuracy, or you have to go field verify the data. Because USGS 30 meter data is just a little too rough. But if you field verify it and you get a good match, you can use it. So it's a tedious process. So for a year, year and a half, we accumulated LIDAR data and sent a team down the East Coast and to some locations on the West Coast, verifying high tide and breach points to get the data. So let me take you back down the coast, over the Gulf, and up. This is East Boston. That's just one and a half meters of sea level rise. This is Point Pleasant, New Jersey. That's just one meter of sea level rise. Lavalette, Dover Beaches, New Jersey. That's just a meter of sea level rise. Brigantine, New Jersey, down near Atlantic City, as we move down the coast, 1.5 meters. Atlantic City, 1.5 meters. Hampton, Virginia, Langley Air Force Base is upper middle part of the screen. That's just a meter. Hundreds of thousands of people live in this area. Elizabeth City, North Carolina, moving down the coast. That's a meter. That's one and a half meters. That's two meters. Hollywood, Florida, just a meter. Fort Lauderdale, 1.25 meters. Miami Beach, one meter. Downtown Miami, 1.25 meters. Cape Coral, on the other side, on the Gulf side, 1.25 meters. I can do 100 locations on both sides of Florida and up the coast, same condition. New Orleans, we're putting 200 to 300 billion dollars into that city to put it back together. Two years later, we're doing a poor job. That's 1.25 meters. Galveston, Texas, 1.5 meters. Go to the west coast, Foster City, San Mateo, down from, across from Palo Alto, that's just a meter. Across the bay, Oakland Airport, 1.25 meters. Union City, down from Oakland Airport, 1.75 meters. San Francisco itself, 2.25 meters. Honolulu, 1.75 meters. This is what happened when one city got flooded. This is where all the people went. The wealthy people probably went to a condo somewhere in the Rockies. 
The poor people, however, left with nothing. And a lot of middle, middle income people. They needed housing. They needed clothing. They needed food. They needed jobs. Their children needed an education. They needed health care. They stressed out many communities. So one city affects the entire country. I could have shown you another 30, 40, 50 locations. We're, mon we're doing them now, doing the study. Where are all these people going to go? With just a meter, 1.25 meters, 1.5 meters of sea level rise. We in this country have grossly underestimated the impact of climate change on the U.S. I would go so far as to say, my own personal judgment, our democracy would have a hard time surviving that kind of impact. So, all of a sudden the prognosis is not Bangladesh. It's not the poor folks in Africa. It's really us here in the U.S. We've wasted a huge amount of time getting a handle on this situation. We've done virtually nothing. Now we have to catch up and hurry up and get the job done. Is it too late? The answer is no. Scientists are telling us not too late. That's the good news. Are there some simple answers? Actually, yes. And we'll go through those. Are there, is there a silver bullet? I believe so. And I'll get to that in a minute. Probably the most important graph you'll see in this entire presentation. <laughs> Let's spend a minute on it. Look at the top bar. That's how much coal in red, oil in blue, and natural gas in yellow. Those are the only three fossil fuels that exist. With coal, we put in tar sands and oil shale. Those are the three fossil fuels. That's how much we burn to push us over to 350, 355 parts per million today. That's where it's gotten us. Now look at the other three bars. You have oil in blue, gas, yellow, and red. You have coal. Now you see that the blue bars are roughly equal in size. The proven world reserves can go either way. There are the disputes as to what it actually is. But we do know that those two are roughly the same size because we're peaking in oil now. We've either peaked, as some would say, we're peaking right now, as a whole nother group would say, or we're ready to peak in the very near future, five, ten years, two years maybe, as some others would say. But we're at the peak of global oil. Now, you know what the peak, peaking curve looks like, a natural resource curve. You go up steeply, you get to the peak, and then you go back down, it's like a bell curve, you go back down the backside, and as you go back down the backside, you're burning less and less, producing less and less, the price goes up and up, because it becomes a rare commodity, and you stretch that resource out over a very, very long period of time, because the cost gets just too expensive. That's the traditional curve. We peaked in the U.S. in 1970 in oil. We peaked in natural gas in 1973, and we're following in the U.S. that curve, so we're on the downside. So in order to make up the difference for our energy appetite, we have to import both gas and oil, and our imports are going up and up every year because our production goes down and down, and we've been able to hold the price down but now we're reading $90 a barrel going to 100, and it's going to break that probably pretty soon. So if you see the blue bar, we're going to stretch that out over a long We're not going to burn all that's in that blue bar. That's not going to fuel global warming. The same thing with natural gas. 
We have 40 years global static lifetime of oil left. That means if we burn it at the present rate, which won't happen. Given the proven world reserves, we have about 60, 63 years of natural gas left, present consumption rates. But that won't happen either, because oil drags gas prices with it. You can't fuel global warming with oil and gas. The only fossil fuel that can fuel global warming and push us past 450 parts per million is coal. Where are the rest of the oil and gas reserves in the U.S.? 70% of it is in what is called the strategic ellipse, an area stretching from Saudi Arabia up through Iran and Iraq into the Islamic republics of the Soviet Union. If we build liquefied natural gas ports, like our government wants to do, where's the natural gas going to come from? The strategic ellipse. What do we have to do to ensure that our investment in the liquefied natural gas ports pay off? Well, we need to secure the shipping lanes and we need to secure that region in order to get the gas. I'm giving you all the headlines in one package. <laughs> Let me talk about coal, the power of coal. There are 151 new coal plants, probably more like 120 now, in various stages of development in the U.S. today. Home Depot is trying to do something worthwhile. They've already funded the planting of 300,000 trees in cities all across the U.S. They spent over a million dollars. They want to spend millions more. They want to plant three million trees. Trees do a number of things. They beautify the city, they create a better microclimate, but they also soak up carbon dioxide. The CO2 emissions from a 500 medium-sized megawatt coal power plant, pulverized coal power plant, in 10 days of operation would negate Home Depot's effort of planting those 300,000 trees over the tree's lifetime, 100 years of sequestering CO2. That's how much CO2 10 days put out. Walmart is spending a half billion dollars to get the energy consumption of its buildings and the greenhouse gas emissions down 20%, entire stock over a seven-year period. Over that seven-year period, if they succeed in getting all the super Walmarts to reduce their consumption by 20%, one month operation of a coal plant negates that half billion dollar effort. <coughs> California just instigated a lawsuit against the EPA for dragging its feet to let them regulate tailpipe greenhouse gas emissions. They want to reduce by 25 percent the emissions in cars, 18 percent in SUVs, beginning in 2009. If in 2009 every car that was sold in California met those standards, eight months of operation of one coal plant, would negate California's entire effort. Now this is years of effort. Now they're suing the EPA. The EPA is dragging its feet and won't even give them that. We've heard change your light bulbs. 110 million households in the US, if you all change your li a light bulb, one light bulb, to a compact fluorescent, two of the 150, 120 coal-fired power plants in a year negates your effort. And 11 states signed up for REGI. They want to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions back to 1990 levels by the year 2014. 13 coal plants would negate that effort. There is a silver bullet, folks, and that is no more coal. 
If you call for a national moratorium on coal, that means no more new conventional coal plants. If you stop that, you have a cap on emissions. If you call for a phasing out of the older, dirty coal plants as they age, we're not putting anybody out of work here, plenty of time to retrain people for healthier jobs. If you phase them out over time and we get an international moratorium as well, no 450 parts per million. We basically save our children's future. One silver bullet, one action does the job. However, there's always two sides to every coin. I just talked about the supply side. There is, unfortunately, a demand side, and that is where you all come in. It's the building sector. Without the demand, there's no need for the coal plants. So we need to get both sides of the equation and the coin under control. 48% of total U.S. energy consumption is consumed by the building sector. 40% of total U.S. consumption is just building operations, heating, lighting, cooling, hot water, and the plug load. 8% is building the buildings. Oak Ridge National Laboratory just came out with a study. 43% of total CO2 emissions in the U.S. is just to operate buildings. Heating, lighting, cooling, hot water, and the plug load, the big five. And we know that 76% of all the energy generated at the coal-fired power plants goes just to operate buildings. Again, the big five. You stop that demand, you stop the need for the coal plants. It's easier to get a moratorium. So about a year and a half ago, we issued the 2030 challenge. We need to implement it. What does it call for? It calls for a 50% reduction in the fossil fuel greenhouse gas emitting energy consumption of all new buildings and major renovations. If you're de designing a school and it uses 100,000 BTUs a square foot a year, your budget's 50. We do this, we renovate about as many square feet as we build new, we renovate down, we now have a bundle of energy to use, we build new up to that level, we've leveled out the building sector. If we do this, the building sector is flat. No more increase in consumption. We say for countries all around the world, renovate as much as you build new. We're doing that in the US, but we ask everybody to do it so that we flatten out the entire global curve. And then we say, get the carbon neutral by 2030, tighten up those standards so that by 2030, no fossil fuel greenhouse gas emitting energy to operate buildings. That's not to mean that buildings aren't going to use energy. They always use energy. But no fossil fuel greenhouse gas emitting energy. Now, it's been adopted by the U.S. Conference of Mayors about a year ago. It was adopted by the American Institute of Architects, the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. It was adopted by the USGBC. Governor of New Mexico issued an executive order. All state buildings must meet it. State of Illinois passed legislation. All state buildings must meet those targets. Recently, Santa Barbara became the first city in the country to pass legislation to put it into their building code a few days ago. That will set a precedent for the entire state of California. The numbers are on our side. This is the entire building stock of the U.S., 250 to 300 billion square feet, fits all within that cube. Over the next 30 years, we'll tear down 52 billion square feet of that. We'll renovate another 150 billion square feet. We'll build new another 150 billion square feet so that by the year 2035, 2037 now, 
three quarters of the built environment in the U.S. will be either new or renovated. You can see the cranes all over the campus. If every building is designed to the 50% standard, we don't need the coal plants. If you build your buildings above that standard, you're going to put tremendous pressure to either build the coal plants or find a substitute. How can we meet the challenge? How difficult is this? Well, if you meet code, Title 24, you're probably 30, 40 percent of the way there anyway, because it's a regional average. We say there are three ways. The first way is the no-cost, low-cost, cost savings option. That's what we're, if we're architects and designers, that's what we're trained for. Passive heating and cooling strategies, daylighting strategies, how we site the building, landscaping to bring down the create a comfortable microclimate, the building shape, its color, its orientation, where you put the glass, how you shade the glass, natural ventilation strategies, materials. There are all sorts of strategies to get you to the 50% that are no cost, low cost, cost savings. And if you can't get there that way, we say then add technology, solar hot water heating, very cost effective. Photovoltaics, small wind, EMS systems, change out the light bulbs, efficient lighting systems, photocells on the lighting systems, keep the lights off when the buildings aren't in use. There are all sorts of ways to do it, cost a little bit. And then we say if you can't get there that way, make the utility give you renewable energy, not coal powered energy. <coughs> Buy the rest if you have to. You can't miss. I was just at the University of Pittsburgh. I talked at their Science 2007 event. I was the keynote speaker. It's all their graduate and doctoral students. It's a big event where they show their work, what they've been working on for the year. And they had a huge hall, twice the size of this, with posters, and the students were standing by their boards and they were studying everything from nanotechnology to little pieces of the heart and how it works and all sorts of esoteric problems, solving those problems. Some of the brightest of the bright, brightest. And they had students from all over the world who were studying there. And they asked me to give the keynote speech. And I went through and I looked at all the projects. And then in the hall, I showed this slide. And I said, I want to play a little game here. Take a look at the two bars on the right-hand side, the red bars. The residences, that's how much energy a typical residence in the U.S. uses, 42,000. Typical inefficient residence in the U.S. uses. 42,700 BTUs a square foot a year. Every square foot of house, that's what it uses over a year. Office building, institutional building, the average is about 85,000. Then I said, let's go all the way over to the left side of the graph. Look at the orange bar, that's Seattle. This is not San Diego, this is a cloudy climate. All the time it's cloudy in Seattle. Or most of the time anyway. Look at the orange bar. That's how much energy in a cloudy climate falls on a square foot of roof, same units, thousands of BTUs a square foot a year. And one square foot of roof, close to 400,000 BTUs a square foot of roof fall in Seattle. Now take the south face in yellow. How many BTUs a square foot a year fall on the south face? about 250, 275,000 BTUs a square foot a year. Now I said, let's play a game. Let's take the yellow bar, put it on top of the orange bar. That's how much energy falls on two faces of a building distributed free in Seattle, cloudiest place in the US. 650,000 BTUs a square foot a year. Let's take the little red bar, the house, put it, the inefficient house, put it next to those two bars, now the one bar. 
That's how much you need in red. That's how much you get distributed free in Seattle. And I said to the doctoral students and the professors and the engineers and scientists that were in the audience, if I give you this problem, that's what we need and that's what I'm gonna give you, delivered free to the site on two faces. Raise your hand if you can't solve this problem. No one raised their hand, obviously. We just sent a probe, a spacecraft, to Saturn. From here, we actually guided it through the rings of Saturn. Now, mind you, there's no planetary emergency here. We measured and took data in the rings of Saturn, send it back to Earth. We now know what it's made of, what kind of gases are, in, are there and everything. We were able to do that in this country. Think about that. Again, there was no planetary emergency here. We weren't, this was not the whole world is gonna be destroyed and especially our country and our democracy. We did that. That's what we need to solve the problem, that little red box. That's what we get distributed free to the site in Seattle. In San Diego, it's off the chart. And we can't solve this problem? Doesn't make sense. We put no money into it. We put no brain power into it. It hasn't been a priority for this country. We haven't even talked about it. And yet we're willing to let our country slip into a huge disaster waiting to happen if the projections are correct that the scientists are talking about. And we have huge other resources. We don't even have to go there. We have geothermal resources. We have biomass resources. We have wind. This country is blessed with other natural resources. And for those who say, we don't have the technology, we can't get there, so there's no use trying, let me point something out. During an 11 year period from 1973 to 1983, inclusive of those two years, we added 30 billion square feet to our building stock, probably 40 billion, 30 to 40 billion square feet to our building stock. We put 35 million new cars on the road. We increased our gross domestic product by over $1 trillion. And in the building sector, we didn't increase our emissions one bit. We didn't in increase our energy consumption. In fact, nationally, as a nation, in 1983, we used two quads less, quadrillion BTUs less energy than we did in 1973. We reduced our energy consumption and did all those things, and I lived through it, and I don't remember it being a hardship. And I, I don't remember changing my lifestyle. Had to drive 55. <laughs> I did, I drive the VW bus. But, um, but we've done it, and we did it with 1970s information and technology. Off the shelf products and materials that, and that I don't remember costing any more at that time than what we have now. And in fact, we have better technology now, and we have better information, and we have better materials now to work with. So for those who say, well, we can't do it, or we need to build the coal plants to keep the lights on, like you see now advertisements, the coal industry is putting 30 million, I don't know how many more million into a big campaign, saying we need coal in order to keep the lights on in Las Vegas. We've been there and done that, and what it does is, 
it underestimates the will and the power of the American people. And California, folks, has been doing it since 1970. This is per capita electricity consumption. The rest of the country, and Gray's been going up, they've held it steady for almost 40 years now. Why? Title 24. Every few years, they ratchet it a little bit. And now they're getting ready for a big ratchet, hopefully, and they'll start bringing that down. California, the first state to say no more imported coal. You got to meet a natural gas plant standard. We need the rest of the country to move with California. We know it can be done, just like I said in the 70s. This is just our buildings. Some of my colleagues are here. Rob is here. Quigley, we've done it in the 70s. I'll just show some of our buildings, because if I show any of friends' buildings, my other friends get on me. So <laughs> is it, we did 80% reduction back in on a library in North Carolina. We've done it in housing. We've done it in schools. We've done it in religious facilities. We've done it in all glass conservatories. Use about 10% what a traditional conservatory uses in terms of energy consumption. Architects know how to do it. They just forgot over this 30, 40 year period because energy went down to $10 a barrel. They now have to relearn it and they'll pick it up real quickly. The AIA has established a 50% benchmark for its membership. The burning question, what about China? They're building one coal plant a week or every two weeks, and they're going to bury us even if we do something, so why should we do anything? Well, you'll see a 11 by 17 sheet that I've left on some chairs here. That was a full page ad in the New York Times the day China came to the US to meet with Bush on climate change a few weeks ago. In that same paper, on that Friday, two pages before the ad, in an article about China, China said if the EU and the US move on climate change, we will follow their lead. But we're not gonna go out and do it alone. Why did China say that? Well, the EU wants to move and Japan wants to move badly. It's only the US that's holding everybody up. The US, the EU, and Japan purchase 78% of all Chinese exports. If the US and the EU and Japan call for a moratorium on coal and help China out with technology and some know-how and some financial aid, probably they will follow. So I leave you with this. This is my granddaughter who lives in Mission Viejo, who I just visited and had dinner with my grandson, I mean my son and my granddaughter and my daughter-in-law last night. They were about five miles from one of the fires up in that area. So I have children and I have grandchildren. I have spent a huge amount of emotional energy bringing up the children getting him a daughter through the teenage years and a son. I don't know how many wrecked cars we had. Uh, they ate a huge amount of food, by the way. <laughs> that cost a lot of money. She didn't want to go to an in-state school, so it cost another 150000 to send her to Syracuse. I think about the investment that I have there. Why in God's earth would I want to leave her a failed planet without the opportunities that I've had to travel, to see the world? I remember, Rob is here, I remember the time we went to China together to speak, 20, 30 years ago maybe. Boy, it's a long time. And I want her to have those same opportunities. That's what my investment is in these kids and now in the grandchildren. We're putting away now 
money in a California program for this little one to go to school in the California system, hopefully. I'm going to leave you with this thought. I want you to visualize this. You're standing there, especially those of you who have kids, and you're chatting with someone. You have a two-year-old, a three-year-old by your side. And you get involved in the conversation. And you're not mindful of the child. And the child takes off while you're involved in the conversation and walks in the middle of a street. You turn around, you look down. Uh-oh, where's the kid? What happens? Your heart pounds out of your chest. You freak out. You look around, you see the child in the street, you get there as fast as you can and you yank him out of the street whether there's a car coming or not. Our children and grandchildren are in the street. Whether there's a car coming or not, no matter what you believe, you need to get out there and yank them out of that street. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.